Right, hello everybody and welcome. Um, I'm Tamara Howard and I'm very pleased to be hosting this event um, because it includes the Dean of the um, Graduate School of Biological, well, whatever it's called these days, BSGS, GSBS, yes, Graduate School yes, yes. of Biomedical Sciences, um, which has just been changed from the Sackler School for any of you who had heard of one but not the other. Our event tonight is um, entitled Biology or Bigotry, what really lies behind the impact of COVID-19 on the BAME community, which for those of you that don't know that expression, which is prevalent around Europe, that stands for Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic Communities. And it's the term that's generally used here. And although we do have Hispanics over here, most of them confine themselves to Spain, um, where a great deal of them happen to have originated. So what we're going to do today is we have two fabulous speakers on this topic um, that I'd like to introduce. The first is um, Dr. Um, Nadikama Amuta Anukagha. And the first thing she's gonna do is pronounce her name for you. And after that, I'm gonna call her Nadidi. Um, she has uh, got such a long biography. As I said to her, I had the choice of reading it all. She's involved in so many things or just picking out some of the high points, but you should really have a look at her background after this session. She's an associate professor in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at the School of um, Medicine at Tufts. And she does research in health disparities, especially around reproductive health, maternal and infant mortality, um, and HIV AIDS. And this is not just a problem in the US, it's a, a big problem everywhere. Um, she's a member of the American Public Health Association and is co-chair of the Perinatal Women's Health Community and Maternal and Child Health se Section. Um, I have a list of grants she's running and in our conversation I hear she just got some more. So um, she's also the founder and director of the Maternal Outcomes for Translational Health and Equity Research Lab called MOTHER, the acronym. Um, it's, and it's a research lab composed of 35 students that range from undergraduates to postdocs who are interested in um, reducing maternal health disparities um, as experienced by black women. So that's Nadidi. Um, I now will, before we kick in, I would also like to introduce Dean Daniel J, who is um, the Dean of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at Tufts, which is also down in the medical school area. I'm gonna make a big fuss about both public health and Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences because every time I'm at the Medford campus, nobody's heard of them, no one knows they exist and they do a tremendous amount of interesting and good work. And Dean Jay is um, a very, very interesting fellow because not only is he professor of developmental molecular and um, chemical biology, he's also an adjunct professor of drawing and painting at the Museum of Fine Arts. And he has, I can honestly say, an equally enthusiastic and strong interest in both disciplines. Um, and I won't go on, because again, he has a CV as long as my arm as well. I won't go on, but I couldn't think of two better speakers to be um, addressing this subject. Um, for us tonight. Now the way this is going to run is Nadidi will speak first and then uh, Dean Jay will speak second and then um, we will ask questions and um, Vicki Garth who's also attending this will um, manage the question sessions. What we'd like to do as you think of them or if you think of them after this after the um, speakers have done their part, um, use the chat section to start listing the questions you want answered and Vicki will go through them in the order in which they're received. So if you're really keen to get your questions answered, type them in as soon as you think of them. All right, um, I think I've covered all the logistics. Did I miss anything? Nope, okay. We are being recorded. So um, if you're worried about that when you ask a question, just beware this whole session is being recorded so that people can um, listen at their convenience. So without further ado, um, I turn this over to Nadidi, please. 
Thank you. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I bring you greetings on behalf of um, the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine, uh, Dean Aviva Must, and all of the members of the Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism Council, some of which are here today, the DEER Council, which is housed in the PHPD programs at Tufts. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, so my name is Dr. Muto Nukagan. I'm going to talk to you about what really lies behind the impact of COVID. And we're gonna look at that impact of COVID on racial and ethnic disparities. Um, my particular focus of research and my passion is addressing maternal health disparities in black women. Um, and so I really just wanted to start off by kind of framing just one, the sheer enormity of the disparities that we see around COVID and two, how these disparities are exacerbated for black indigenous people of color, um, and other ethnic minorities. And so the first kind of major challenge as it pertains to um, Black women in birth around COVID is that COVID has really forced many hospitals and healthcare institutions to either shut down or increase restrictions on visitors, including partners or spouses and preventing duels from entering the delivery room, which causes a huge emotional strain on expected mothers. Um, also a resource um, strains such as the delivery of lactation services, peer-based programs for breastfeeding, um, the utilization of doulas and midwives has really been suspended because of the pandemic. And so this really forces a lot of new mothers to change or pivot from their breastfeeding plans and their birthing plans, the way they had planned to give birth or the people they would have liked in a room or where they plan to deliver. These things have had to really change and shift um, during COVID, which obviously is posing a new challenge for Black mothers who are at a disadvantage financially and may not have the ability to um, move in those circumstances. Um, COVID has also had an impact on the workforce with a particular focus on women of color. We know that women of color are at increased risk of contracting the virus because they disproportionately are employed in occupations that are people facing front facing, such as grocery store workers, healthcare workers, delivery drivers. Um, in addition, a lot of these types of positions really lack paid leave or sick days. And so you have people that are on the front lines where the exacerbation of disparities is highest, the likelihood of disparities is highest, and then the likelihood of having paid time off or sick leave to address the COVID, the impact of COVID is less. So this is, um, Dr. Uche Blackstock, we actually just had her come to speak at Tufts about a week ago, and she talked about the impact of um, racism in medicine. And she talks about, she's an emergency room physician, she talks about an algorithm that was developed to allocate resources to critically ill patients, because we all know that at the height of the pandemic, resources were scarce, and there was a lot of rationing that had to happen for ventilators and other really important medical devices. But these algorithms have been shown to underestimate the needs of critically ill Black patients. So an algorithm is like a medical calculator, right? You take this, this social indicator, you take this data, and you put it into an algorithm, and then you can make, quote unquote, informed decisions. So we see this play out. Even in the COVID-19 pandemic, there was an exacerbation of these racially biased algorithms. So when it comes time for hospitals and clinicians to really think about how do we give our resources, who's the priority population, where do we put our energy and our focus, we can assume that Black patients will continue to be at a disadvantage. And this is not only with COVID, I also see it a lot in the research I do around maternal health disparities. There's a vaginal birth after cesarean session algorithm that puts Black and Hispanic women at a lower risk proportionate to the research uh, for having um, a, a successful vaginal birth after a C-section. So these algorithms have a racial bias built into it. And we saw that exacerbation really play out when it came time to COVID and who was at the top of the list and how the decisions were made ethically and resource-wise. So I just also wanted to spend a minute talking about the impact of COVID-19 on homeless populations. We know that a disproportionate number of Black people and other people of color really experience homelessness, and many more are at risk for displacement due to several systemic inequalities. We saw this play out recently that as a situation that happened in Houston, Texas about a month ago, where there was a natural disaster and many people died. Um, unnecessarily because of the systemic inequalities. So when you couple the impact of COVID on the homeless population, you see that the disparities are exacerbated even more. 
So then you look at the impact of COVID on, on the financial market, right? And this data really looks at unemployment by race, ethnicity. So people of color here are the red line and white people are the gray line. And so I think, you know, this is this data is pre-pandemic. And I, and I think if we were to look and see what the numbers look like now, which is most of it is preliminary data because we're obviously still in the pandemic. But the case that I'm making is that this financial strain of, of people of color facing greater exclusion from the labor market, as I mentioned earlier, being in more positions of service delivery, being more um, patient-centered in their um, occupation really exacerbates the financial strain. Even at the height of the epidemic, excuse me, at a pandemic when the majority of people were sitting at home, working from home, pivoting to, you know, creating their home offices and, and really retrofitting their homes to be able to work, the majority of people still were on the front lines, either in healthcare or delivery services, which continues to disproportionately impact people of color, right? And so we know that for unemployment, the financial strain has grown even higher. The financial gap is, gap is even greater between communities of color and white people. And that has been undermined and underscored and really illuminated as a result of the pandemic. So what are some opportunities for really addressing implicit bias, either you know, as people experience the healthcare system or as people are navigating to get resources for COVID. So some colleagues and I, Dr. Tony Schlaff and Fernando Ono, we developed a curriculum here to really train clinicians to be actively anti-racist. And I think the, the centering of anti-racist research and, and curricula for medical students really trains people, one, to work more efficiently and to better serve their patients, and two, develop stronger relationships with their patients, which can address the impact of structural racism, really kind of mitigate racism in a medical encounter, as we saw exacerbated by COVID. Um, and the key take-home message is really this need to address racism, both in medical education, delivery of medical services, um, before seeking to direct students to take care of it in their clinical care. So when we talk about equity and income and how COVID has really exacerbated that. So I showed you data earlier on unemployment and also looking at average incomes and then the average income with a lens of racial equity, right? And so we know that for black populations, if we were looking at racially equitable pay, then that would increase the average income of people of color by 18,000, which represents a 49% gain. So we know that this economic insecurity, housing insecurity, food insecurity is exacerbated by communities of color as a result of the pandemic. And we need to do more to make sure that people are receiving equitable streams of income, have equitable opportunities to advancement, and really try to mitigate and buffer some of the, the racism and the way that COVID was exacerbated throughout these situations. And that's all I have. I'm going to leave it here on my contact information. Um, I think I'm right about my time. <laughs> so thank you all so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Over to now to um, Dean Jay. Um, thanks, uh, Tamara and uh, Ndidi. Uh, I'm humbled by uh, by this one because Ndidi brought slides, and I don't have any slides. <laughs> That's uh, fine. And, and, you know, and two, she is a she is a world expert in this aspect of health disparity and communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, communities of color. Uh, I'm not an expert in this particular area, but I meant to talk about the biology aspect of it. And when when um, Tamara approached uh, uh, Nidhi and me about this idea, it was really the, I, the, the concept that there is no, there's absolute clear evidence that uh, communities of color are suffering more in, in COVID, uh, in the COVID pandemic than other communities. Um, and she raised the simple hypothesis or question, I guess, is this, uh, and Diddy has clearly presented the case that these communities suffer from racism and bigotry. Um, but then uh, Tamara thought, well, there maybe there's also a physiological aspect of it. Um, and um, I guess I was sort of meant to take that um, um, that, that quote unquote other side, but let me give you a spoiler alert, um, Nindidi's right. <laughs> um, so this isn't really a debate, but let me explain some of 
the biology of, of what, what could be going on or what people are thinking. And so um, one I wanna give, I do have little <laughs> uh, uh, things. This is a book called, which is backwards, Everyone is African. It's written by um, uh, a geneticist and sculptor. So a man after my own heart named Daniel J. Fairbanks at the University of Utah. He and I will actually, I, we, we hope to meet in August and work together on a project uh, in, at the Art Science Interface about these questions. But anyway, um, the, the subtitle is How Science Explodes the Myth of Race. So let me first start off by the concept that we all think about race and have a, think we have a good idea what that is. And one of the most obvious aspects of this is, is, is skin color, right? And, and going back historically, of course, this was um, prior to genetics uh, or an understanding of genetics, this was an obvious difference uh, between populations from different parts of the world. And so this was taken as uh, differences in race. And with that, and here's the social component, um, it was used as a means by which particular groups were subjugated, were thought of as less than such that they might be used and exploited for economic reasons. And the best example coming from uh, the new world is the fact that populations from Africa were brought over to effectively be slaves, a workforce that made financial sense for people who had plantations that grew cotton or sugar uh, or, or uh, 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 rubber, wherever, whichever part of the new world you were in. Um, and so um, this sets up a dynamic, in, at least in America, um, of, um, of, of a population that is um, initially enslaved, but even after the slaves were so-called freed uh, in the Civil War, were subjugated because there was a financial incentive to do so. Um, this was supported by, um, by you know, a, 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 a morality based on the fact that people of different races, uh, i.e. not the white European race, were it somehow inferior and thus um, their exploitation was still within one's moral code be, uh, for the predominant religion. Um, needless to say, um, this led to a generational uh, defect in the communities, uh, the resources provided for groups going back back to 1619 when the very first uh, Black Africans were brought to the U.S. Um, for, um, uh, for slavery as, as slaves. And in fact, 1619 project is a project to, to, uh, to uh, recognize that date as, uh, uh, as the beginning of, of of that aspect of at least racism against blacks in this country. Um, so um, here's where we get into the conundrum and getting to, to Tamara's question. Maybe there are genetic differences between races that make a particular group of people more susceptible to disease severity, in this case, to COVID severity. Possible, not likely. And then that's why I bring up uh, Daniel's book here where he really goes through this piece by piece. Um, and we have some scientists among you, but maybe not many, but as you know, in the last 20 years, we've established the complete sequence of the human genome for all of us, or for, for the 3 billion uh, uh, bases, the code that encodes each of us. And so as I look across this room, we have people of different races, et cetera, we are all 99.9% .9 the same. And there is a greater diversity between people of so-called the same race, let's say a white Europeans, if there are a couple of white Europeans amongst you, than there is between any of the races. So in other words, if we took it, take a look at the simple genetics of it, there's not a real good valid um, reason to consider a biological definition of race. But you say, we have the skin color thing, right? That's an obvious thing that, that in Diddy looks different than I, that looks different than Tamara as I look across my screen um, in terms of the skin color. So I, I have an art project, which is called the melanin project. Melanin, does everyone know what that is? That's this pigment that's in skin color. It's also the pigment that's in, in the, the tiger stripe and, and squid ink. It's a bi basic biological compound that's a polymer of a, an amino acid called tyrosine. So um, dark skin evolved as a, 
as a beneficial mutation, not once, not just in Africa, but in several different places, including India, including Australia, as a later evolution that was a benefit to people who were exposed to high sun and didn't require the vitamin D that one needs in, in northern climes because there's not enough sunlight. Uh, I mean, it protected individuals um, in, in the sort of more equatorial locations uh, from the hazardous UV effects of, of, of the, the intense sunlight that, that is seen there. So um, the idea that skin color, which is a mutation, a beneficial mutation, is in some way uh, marks a particular group from a particular part of the world as inferior, doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. <laughs> Um, so the project that I put together was to use melanin as an art medium to discuss the issues of race and skin color. And one fact is um, the difference between the darkest person on this screen and the lightest person is a, is a concentration of this melanin, this pigment of a factor two, twofold. So, so let me show you the first example of, of that work project. Can people sort of see this sort of? So what you see here is a chemical structure. It's the chemical structure <coughs> of this polymer melanin. And what you might be able to see is on, the, on, on the, the right side, it's darker than on the left side, and there are rows. Each row is a two-fold dilution of a squid ink that was used to draw the structure, the chemical structure of melanin. To give you a sense of the way a scientist looks at things, I guess, and if you look at this, you can, you can sort of see red, but you can't read the numbers because they're backwards. This, was, um, this is a small uh, prototype, but the big work has 400 squares dating for, and they're numbered 16, 19 to 2020. Um, so these are the, each square represents a year of slavery or racism, structural racism for America. Um, so the idea that thinking about these two-fold differences that are, are kind of insignificant, that's so, so almost a, a mathematical thing, that we would ever think that this is a reasonable reason to consider one group to be inferior to another, to enslave them, to put them to, you know, to work, to breed them, all of those aspects that, um, that, that the dominant religion at the time would, would not do to, to any of their own, um, is part of the fallacy that this work begins to address. So as a chemist by training, I like writing chemical things. Then I thought about using this as a calligraphy, as a, almost, a, so using this to make drawings out of, and I'll show you this work. Can everyone see this work? Okay, so um, you may be able to recognize the image. It's, a, it's a, a caricature of George Floyd. And George Floyd was the individual who was uh, uh, murdered by the Minnesota police um, and led to, um, uh, to uh, the, the protest that occurred starting in June uh, in this country and all over the world. So um, if you see the panels along here, that's what an artist does to do what they call grayscale and each square is a two-fold dilution of the, the square uh, below it. And then if you look carefully, um, the face of George Floyd is made out of that uh, chemical structure. And it's almost like it's a shroud, a death shroud around this martyr uh, with, the, with melanin, with the, with the black skin for which he uh, was was cursed, shall we say, cursed, I'm putting in quotations, um, and, and, uh, and killed. Um, so um, I presented these works and, and gave a, a much longer version of this talk to uh, underserved youth, Boston youth at the Boston Public Library to get them thinking, gave them little samples of squidding so that they could make art. And, and we'll all come back together to sort of see what they come up with as they think about Black Lives Matter and social justice and structural racism. So um, that, that's what I think about and how I deal with it in terms of my art science work. But it, getting back to the main issue here, the, 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 the idea that um, skin color is in any way a predictive value for, um, for the susceptibility to disease, uh, there's no evidence for that at all. However, let me talk about a little bit of biology and I'll finish with this, is that there is a phenomenon that's called epigenetics. 
And this is the fact that individuals subjected to an environment will change how their DNA is expressed by something called epigenetics. There's a, uh, a change to the structure of the DNA that is a permanent change. Worse off, it's, it's a permanent change that is passed on generation to generation. Actually, it's through the male sperm. So it's male to the offspring. And um, uh, what people are working on these days is the fact that a poor, um, poor meaning um, uh, inadequate environment or a, a stressful environment leads the community population to having these epigenetic permanent changes that are passed on generation to generation and make, um, well, they cause whatever changes they cause. But in this case, one of the things that could be a biological thing is the fact that we, we have communities of color that have been disadvantaged from generation to generation, such that there are these epigenetic changes that may change their susceptibility to a disease. I think that may be a factor. I think the greater factor is, of course, all the other issues that Ndidi just brought up was the fact that these individuals are disadvantaged in the care they get, in the, uh, in the opportunities they get, the exposure they get. Um, Tamara raised the issue that in, in Europe, of course, you have a much more civilized and, uh, and, uh, and uh, healthcare system that is public health. That being said, you also have communities that are discriminated against, that have suffered generation to generation uh, of, of, of feeling that you are not part of the community, that you are stressed, that you are in fear. And my feeling is if there is any biological component, that could be it. But th there's much research to be done on that. And of course, we're so early in the pandemic that, 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 that we don't know this. But it's certainly been an issue for diseases like cancer, for example, where cancer is more prevalent in, in communities of color, for example, probably not due to their, their, their DNA genetics, but to this epigenetics from, from living their lives and the lives of their parents and grandparents in disadvantaged communities. So um, I think I'll stop there so that we can keep within time. Um, this is really meant for, uh, for you to ask questions and to, um, to, uh, to really benefit from Indidi's expertise and, and my ramblings. <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, Vicki, do you want to take the question? I just wanted to say one thing that I wasn't clear. I didn't mean to equate race with color. I know that sounds peculiar, but when you're over here in Europe, I mean, to the English, the French are a different race. <laughs> I, and I'm not being facetious, I'm, I'm just saying, it, it isn't necessarily a color thing, um, although color does clearly play a role. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I thought it was a very interesting perspective you took and I liked it and I liked the mix with art, but um, I, it was my fault for not, not being clear on things like, like that. So apologies, I'll, I'll turn it over to Vicky to deal with other people's questions. Hi everybody, just to repeat what uh, Tamara said at the beginning, um, if you put your questions in the chat, I will call on you to um, to speak them out. But it just sort of helps, you know, ha you handle it if it's if, if it's not coming from two directions. Um, at the moment, we just have one comment from David Tybor. And um, David, do you want to speak for a minute or two about the books that you're recommending? Um, Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increase inequality and automating inequality. Are you there, David? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Didi, hi, Dan. Thanks for uh, looking forward to talking with you guys. Dan, I hope you can post some links so that we can see more of your, uh, your art. That's fantastic. Um, I, just, I just wanted to put in a plug for these two books there. Um, I saw Didi's slide about um, the algorithms and uh, we need to think carefully about what data are going into them. And it's uh, important to think about we know a little bit about the cognitive biases that exist um, in our own minds and what biases exist in the, uh, um, the silicon minds that are running a lot of the uh, AI and the algorithms that we're doing now. So those are just a couple books. Um, if anybody wants to read or do a little book club, uh, let me know. And um, I'll mute myself now for the more important questions, which I see are, are coming into the chat now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Dean, do you want to ask your question about reversing epi epigenetic effects? Dean Jennings? Uh, 
Okay. Um, well, the question. That's my. I'm using my husband's computer. This is oh, actually. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, mine is broken at the moment. Anyway, um, I just wanted to know: is you know the epigenetic effect of this? Um, could I assume it would take generations to reverse that? And how um, long do you think is it possible, even? Yeah, so we, we don't, uh, I, I say the, the, what I described is, has been studied in animals, animal models like mice, to a much greater extent. We know a lot about the biochemistry of individual reactions. We, what we also don't know is the complexity of how these chemical changes then relate, that we, we know how they relate to changes of expression of particular genes, but how all that adds together to either uh, contribute to susceptibility to disease or behavior, or uh, you know, um, susceptibility to drug abuse, you know, all of these kinds of things is we're so far from this in anything other than a mouse. So, uh, but but anyway, these things can be reversed, um, uh, and so uh, I have a colleague here at Tufts, Larry Feig, who's done this with respect to environments that are either stimulatory and um, or deprived, and has shown that we can change in mice. This, these epigenetic things, and, and also it's correlated with the, the behavior of the mice that they're either more aggressive or less aggressive, um, and that it, it is transferred via the sperm from male to, uh, to offspring. Um, but this is at mice, it's a speculation, but, but um, there, there are people who work on, on, on the exposome, they call it, the, the, the idea of we are the sum total of our environmental experiences. And if that's going to affect anything, it would affect this epigenetics. I hope that answered your question. It's a complicated <laughs> one that we don't have a lot of answers for yet, unfortunately. Yes, it does. I like to know when you get more research on it, what, um, what comes out of it, you know, but just to be hopeful that there's something we can do Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question for Dean Jay and Nadidi. Um, is there any place that uh, Tufts alums receive um, information that, you know, where there's updates on your research and, and grants you may get? And because, you know, I, I read Tufts now, but I don't know if a lot of your things are reported there, where the best Tufts source is to stay updated in what you're doing. Um, I, people can get information from our PHPD um, newsletter weekly, um, and we also have a number of, of mailings that come out, so if people are subscribed um, to those listeners, then they, they should be able to get the information on a regular basis. Great, thank you. So same with us, but also I think both uh, PH and, and GSBS have websites and they highlight, you know, exciting things that are happening on the, on the with nice photos and, and things, so I presume that Indeed, his work will be presented there too. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, Serge Rosiles, um, you were asking a question about the history of abortion and heightened risks um, of giving birth. Do you want to elaborate on your question? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy that we had the speakers here today and the facilitators. I think What's great about this discussion, what we're learning is that, you know, diverse perspectives really help us build, you know, stronger, more um, stronger understandings about um, medicine in this regard to, to racism and anti-racism. I appreciate learning about um, the opportunities like hearing about DEER and the different, um, you know, organizations happening, uh, the different uh, things that people are doing at Tufts right now. I, I recently uh, graduated from SMFA, so I appreciate the, the discussions about art, but equally, I really respect um, what we had to say about social justice and uh, women in medicine and racism um, in medicine, because a lot of my, my work at school, we, we, under, we talk a lot about social justice, and um, in that regard, we, uh, my own work would have to deal with um, thinking about women, like, um, from a personal perspective, um, and painting and writing about um, women crossing, crossing the border, so Lots of Hispanic people, as Summer described us as Hispanic, uh, we, we don't always identify. Some of us will, will encourage the identity Latinx, and others will even, uh, like myself, try to understand our indigenous um, perspectives. I think to have an indigenous perspective, we have to, to understand that there's still indigenous people to be heard. Um, a lot of times, indigenous people don't have 
um, the recognition um, like in spaces um, because there's there's not so many of them in numbers but um, I appreciate everything like we we talked about about slavery as well in addition to all the things we talked about so my question is um, how do we discuss um, abortion abortion is such like a, a hot uh, button topic but a lot of times abortion is met with like um, very racist um, you know, men in medicine who uh, were doing unethical things or, or women as well. Um, they, they were founders of Planned Parenthood and things that we consider to be, you know, relatively good for, for women and families. But um, it's a very, I think there's a complicated history that uh, should be discussed. Yeah, thank you for those questions. I think you're right. The history of abortion and the way that women access services in this country is definitely steeped in racism and the racist practices of providers um, and clinicians. And I think, um, you know, the way we address it is by calling it out and by naming racism. And, you know, part of the curriculum that I mentioned where we're training future clinicians is really to arm people with the resources and skills to address anti-racism in a really direct way. Either one as allies for um, people of color or for people of color to also feel empowered to speak up for themselves and to protect themselves in these structurally violent situations. Um, and so when we see these microaggressions or macroaggressions occurring, the best thing to do is to address them um, directly and I think when you're taught, and also to be informed, right? Like a lot of people probably don't know the history of, of the eugenics movement of, you know, Margaret Sanger, of Planned Parenthood, of James Marion Sims, who's been dubbed the father of gynecology. There is a lot of racism steeped in the historical practice of medicine. And so the more information that we have, and the more that we are comfortable calling out racism when we see it presenting itself, you know, Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, who's one of the foremost scholars on racism in the United States, always asks the question, how is racism operating here? And so when you ask that question, I think it's important to note that the opportunities to address it are going to be higher because we're we're in a space of understanding and opening. But if we don't address it, if we don't call it out, if we act like it doesn't exist or we're in a post-racial society, we're not going to be able to make the headway that we need to make. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, if I could add to that, uh, some of you probably all know that the university, the medical school, my school, have all pledged to becoming anti-racist institutions and doing the work toward that. So uh, the, the points that Nidhi was just, were just raising um, should be part of the curriculum. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're now reviewing the entire medical school curriculum, and our school is also doing that, to go through every course by course to address um, are there issues, uh, are, are there lectures in it or points being made that uh, are racist, that uh, sh you know, demonstrate a structural uh, racism that uh, are built upon these things. Some of those points would be key topics for our students to discuss. Um, and hopefully uh, the, 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 this has just gotten started this year. So um, hopefully within a year, every course will be examined and new curriculum will be added that addresses these points that, uh, that so our students are at the very least aware um, and uh, the, these problems are deep, they are hard to solve um, uh, and will you know, take many years, but we have to start somewhere. So I, I think the, the tragedies that have occurred this year has have at least provided you know, American society, probably world society with an impetus to say, this cannot continue, we need to change. And now is the time. Vicky, could I just ask um, any of the people that ask questions, could you identify what country you're speaking from, just so that we know, just be interesting. Sorry, Vicky, I didn't mean to. No worries, no worries, good idea. Um, David, you're back. Would you like to ask your next question? Hi, uh, yeah, this is uh, David Tyra. I teach at uh, Tufts at the med school in the country. I'm, I'm not sure which country I'm in. I haven't left my house in, uh, in about a year. <laughs> Um, in the home country. <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit about the structural and institutional racism and in the role in vaccine distribution, particularly with respect to the, um, the efficacy on the different vaccines and, and wh what communities they're ending up in uh, and so on? Um, Nidhi, do you want to take Sure, I can take that. Um, yeah, we talk about this in my class. I think it's interesting to note that the distribution process is 
quite flawed. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for how it's being handled. If you don't have access to an internet connection, if you don't have time to continually refresh you know, when I was trying to get an appointment for my mother-in-law, I had three different screens. I had the CVS, I had Vaccine MA, I had the State Department, and, and I'm refreshing. I'm doing it at midnight, I'm doing it at three o'clock, I'm doing whenever I can find a window. We finally got her registered. She got her a shot this week at the Reggie Lewis Center here in Boston at, in Roxbury. Thank you, which is a majority black and brown neighborhood. And my husband remarked, he, he took her in while I stayed in the car with the baby. He said, I cannot believe how many white people are there. These people have never been to the Reggie Lewis Center before in their life. <laughs> <laughs> Roxbury is a predominantly minority community. And, and I, I think the way that we approach the vaccine rollout was flawed from the beginning. If you don't have internet access, you're not going to be able to do that. I have the luxury of working from home. I can be on my iPad and my laptop and my cell phone, all these different screens trying to get her an appointment. What if you're an hourly worker? You think people are going to, what, they're going to go in a break room for 10 minutes and try to get an appointment? It's impossible. You need a steady connection and you need time. And then you have to be able to go and take the time off. We booked the afternoon my mother-in-law went. I cleared my calendar. Why? Because I'm in control of my schedule. I have autonomy, right? And so I cleared my calendar. I took my conference calls on the AirPod thing. And we had a nice, lovely family afternoon. It was very leisurely, very stress-free. Took the baby to the park while she's getting her appointment. That's all best case scenario. <laughs> That's best case scenario that you can clear your appointment, your your calendar for half a day and like make an outing out of getting a vaccine. Most people don't have that. If you're late for an appointment, you miss your window or if you if you can't get a ride, you can't afford an Uber, how are you going to get there or you plan to take the bus, the bus is late. It's just the system is flawed. And the last thing I'll say about it is I was incredulous at the locations that we chose to do the vax. I was so disappointed with it. Like, why are we doing a mass vaccination center in Foxborough? How can you get to Foxborough from Boston? You want to take an Uber? You got to rent a car. One of my students in my class said that he had to rent a car. He has a credit card to rent a car. He has time. He has resources. Like, how do we expect people to get this thing? Like, let's tell ourselves the truth. If you don't have a certain level of agency or income, you're not going to get it. What I need to see us do for me, for my faith to, I got to close this email, <laughs> for my faith to be restored in this system is I need to see us take a mobile van to the community. I need to see a mobile van running all up and through Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, Hyde Park, Jamaica Plain, where the people are and just mass vaccinate everyone. The system is, we're not going to get herd immunity in communities of color if people can't get to the vaccine. Now, when we were really at the height of trying to find her an appointment, we would have gone to a Natick, had some random place <laughs> an hour from Boston. Why? Because we have the time and the resources. You pack this car up, you can go put it, you know, you can fuel up the car and go. That is not the case for most people. So I just really want to emphasize the digital divide, the, the control over your time. I make my schedule. If I need to clear my calendar for the whole day, I can do that. And I'm not going to lose any pay. I'm not going to lose any sleep. My job is not in jeopardy. That is not the case for most people who really are vulnerable right? If you're late to work, you're docked. If you're too late, you're fired. So I just, I, I don't see how we can really pat ourselves on the back for what we're doing. The system and the rollout is completely a disaster. So thanks. Can I just speak for the Europeans here? Just to say that um, most of Europe is nationalized medicine. My local doctor's surgery, as much as I can complain about them, they do what I ask. Um, is around the corner. So I go by foot, it takes me two minutes and I live in the countryside. So uh, everybody is called in by priority, um, regardless of sex, race or anything. It's the 80 year olds then above the 75, then above the 70s and above the 60s. The problem they're facing now that they've gone into above 50 years old is a great many of the BAME community are refusing to take vaccinations. Um, not that they're not available. Most of them are given on Fridays or Saturdays so that they don't interfere with work, but it wouldn't matter anyway. It's considered a legitimate reason to be off work and you wouldn't be fired. And I think that's pretty much true 
I mean, Ivy could probably speak for France and I don't know what other countries of Europe are represented on this, but uh, I think it's pretty much true around Europe as well. So whereas I think I agree with everything you say about the US, it has some very unique problems because of its history. And there are problems of discrimination um, by what I would call race, not necessarily skin color, by ethnic group, ethnic group here um, uh, that are strong, but a lot of them are pulling themselves out of a process um, and having to be talked into participating. And that's the problem that we're facing here, I think. Yeah, I was hoping someone would come in on Europe because uh, it, it would be interesting to see. So one of the things that comes up with you, and you're right that that uh, I mean, as I think of a, uh, uh, is it BAME? Is that how you pronounce it? BAME, B-A-M-E, yeah. I used to stay uh, in a suburb of Paris called Nanterre, which was primarily Muslim. Yeah. This was um, a group that was not connected. And I think that there is a level of distrust of, of, of national services. And I think it's similar to what we see with the distrust of our communities of color in the US. So th that's one issue that comes. The other thing that we faced, I think, in the US, I, I was sharing before people came on that Massachusetts, which has excellent healthcare and tech, biotech, and, and all these kinds of things, fell well behind for that they didn't get their act together, whereas states like West Virginia, which doesn't have these things, uh, we're way ahead of us, um, but I think that the distribution pattern was different. We aimed at, at putting, you know, dedicating our resources to putting it into a football stadium that was 50 miles away from, from, from where the people were, um, whereas uh, in West Virginia, they said, let's use the local pharmacies, and the distributions were, were, were done there. It sounds similar to what you've done. One of the things that really concerns me as a worldwide issue is that there's clearly going to be an issue of inequity with regard to rich yeah. and poor countries. And we're just beginning to see this. Um, and so I'm happy to live in a rich country and I will be vaccinated on Monday because again, I had the time to go on the internet at midnight and I had an internet and all those kinds of things. But, but what we're, uh, um, how that problem will be solved or not solved, I think will be a very interesting um, uh, and maybe tragic question that we'll face in the next uh, few months. Well, it's rather interesting because in Europe, again, what because of the tendency for some communities to want to live together, it's not so, so many of them are ghettoized. Denmark has just passed a law that's limiting the number of different ethnic groups that can concentrate themselves into neighborhoods in an attempt to get people to integrate better into the overall community and to meld better because those, uh, the, the communities are very strong and pull themselves apart. And then you get the suspicion and difficulties. So we'll see how the Danish experiment works out. Um, I mean, they're really pretty an open-minded and liberal country. So let's see what kind of how their experiment works with their, um, and I guess, it, I think it's mostly Muslim, again, communities that um, they're experiencing integration difficulties with. Um, so there we go. And I just want to, about algorithms, I agree, they're awful. I was absolutely horrified to discover that if I went into hospital, being over 60, I would probably be rapidly deprioritized for any of the care because it was all done on the basis of age. But um, I did want to, based on what you're saying, ask her a quick question before she goes, which is, um, you know, what role do the, the medical schools, you know, both the GSBS and the, you know, the School of Public Health have in educating populations and increasing their willingness to take these vaccines and not do damage to themselves. And DJ, I saw you waving your hand, so I'll start with you. <laughs> no, that was only so, because I knew Nididi had to leave and I wanted to give her anyone a chance to ask her a question, so that you just did, so. Okay, okay, Nididi, have you, are you willing, do you have time to answer the question? Yes, about mental health? Yes. Well, no, um, no, about um, educate. You know the role of the um, medical schools in educating the communities that these things are in their best interest and and reducing resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think that would both be in the United States, but also abroad as well, because it's going to be important for all of Africa and all of Asia to be inoculated as well as 
Europe and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think medical schools, that, that's inherently part of our mission is to right, do no harm. We train future clinicians. We also um, are really big and should be doing more around medical education for the community. So a lot of the work I do is community engaged. Yes, I sit in the School of Medicine, but I all my work has um, a community lens. I have a community advisory board for my research study. I, um, you know, I talk to and work within communities to really get the context of what needs to be done. And I provide opportunities for collaboration through funding, through grants. I have community partners on my grants. One of my community partners is a co-investigator on my grant. And, you know, I think the more you can fold the community in and really center the voices of the community um, who are experts ultimately in their own lives and their own experiences and know exactly what they need, I think the better off we'll, we'll be. And I, Floor, I second everything you said about the sheer enormity of the disinformation and the, the roots of the medical mistrust and distrust, which are completely understandable for communities that have been traumatized for centuries, you know, from the medical community. Um, and so I think the way that we can move this work forward is to be in partnership with communities and to provide opportunities to center community members and to incentivize and pay community members for their expertise. You don't need a PhD to be an expert. You don't have to go to medical school to be an expert. Your lived experience, your, your lived narrative, your context is enough to make you an expert in these spaces. And so really prioritizing and honoring the, the roles and the value that community brings will help us work with communities to spread more credible information and to kind of disrupt the disinformation that's everywhere. So thank you. And on that note, I really have to yeah, go. With thank this. you. Before you rush off, Nadidi, thank you very, very thank much you. for contributing. I know how busy you, you are. I, I know thank everyone you. appreciated it. Yeah, I also want to say pleasure. that if any of the rest of you have questions, Dean yes. Jay has offered to stay on and answer some as well. Um, if thank you do, you. but Nadidi, thank you so much. Thank it's been you, a pleasure. Everyone. Thank thank you. We're losing our star though, but I'm, I'm happy to <laughs> keep on going here. Thank I'm you passing so much. The time. Thanks, thank you, everyone. And good luck thank with you. all your work. Thank you so much. Pleasure meeting all of you. Thank you, DJ. Good to see you again. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. So and we do have was, a. Sorry. Was too modest to say that she had just been on a on a, a call with the National Public Radio here. So she does more than her share of reaching out to community and spreading the word. And, and, and so, so she she not only talks the talk, she walks the walk yeah. um, <laughs> and, in, in doing what she does. And, and we all have a responsibility. She's she's one of the leaders. I'm, I'm noticing a chat in the line about from Flora, how do, how do we tackle this? And I think we all need to be community activists these days and do what we can, speak to our communities and, 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 and reach out. This is this is life and death, unfortunately, um, uh, for, for people. And um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. And I think Serhé had another question. Serhé, do you want to step in? Yeah, I would like to just to go after uh, what, what Flora was talking about, you know, because um, I, I was just thinking, you know, a lot of times like in, in art for me, we talk about um, mental health, uh, you know, mental health of artists or like communities and how we develop our sense of community and in medicine too, um, because I, I studied a bit of, of like how uh, medicine, um, functions like how how doctors and um, I know I know some people in medicine so what, what I learned from them um, and I also think like in this sense like the you know intersectional studies is really important um, I, I think in addition to, to the epigenetics that that um, Dean Jay was describing um, I like the way I, I've understood that is um, like referred to as transgenerational stress which is like I just looked it up and it's like um, exposure like effects of stress, exposure in parents to their offspring. So it's, it's very, very similar in that regard, like they go hand in hand. Um, but in, in addition to that, um, like our, I think individual sense of community many times um, kind of uh, creates like, um, it can create like a sense of trust, but also like how, how people were mentioning like a sense of distrust in, in larger systems that are meant to like assist can, can also like be um, detrimental. So um, I think, when we have like uh, the face of a doctor who who people you know want to trust but um maybe the doctor has his his or her own perceptions um that's met with like the experience um and the i guess emotional intelligence of um, of the patient so um i think I, for me mental health can play a huge role in um in understanding uh, like where or how 
or um, who to trust and where to get access to medicine. So I'm wondering. Actually, I think um, what you're saying is feeding into a question I had for Dean Jay, which was, you know, if epigenetics is caused by stressors in an environment and it's passed on, um, I had two, two forms of questions. One, can it be undone for future generations by improved mental health care, which is becoming much more aware and, you know, improve racial, racial attitudes and equality. And also, is there a difference in epigenetics? Like, like, let's say you have people coming from the same place in East Africa, but some went to the States, some ended up in Europe, heaven only knows where the rest ended up. Would their epigenetics epigenetics be different would their, you know, because their stressors would have been different. So two questions there. And one of them I hope is pulling on what Serge was asking. Yeah. So um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I ended with the epigenetics, but more as an indication of um, uh, to really counter the idea that I think the, 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 the biology by itself is probably not a huge determinant to, to answer tomorrow's first question, but this might be an avenue, and I don't mean to overplay this uh, and get your hopes up here, but this is really more of one mechanism by which people can think about it. And your, your major question, and I think the important sociological one, can this be undone? Absolutely. These are changes that can occur, but needless to say um, that, that, um, that, that uh, they, um, there are opportunities for, and again, these are from animal studies, where if you change the environment, you change these markers on the DNA and you change the behaviors, uh, et cetera. So to extrapolate, and I use that word correctly, to human populations, the idea here is that providing a nurturing environment, removing the stressors, uh, can can start reversing the process in, in in that in that generation. So it's not like we have to wait many many generations. Um, but we what we've had at least in the U.S. is uh, you know going back several hundred years, generation after generation, which has been um, detrimental to to a group. Um, to get to Sergey's other point about. Um, community value, it's an interesting point. And when I think about it, every community has a different way of perceiving the world based on their cultural values, how they're raised, what's important to them. And one can imagine there are certain groups for which family is the critical uh, connecting element. Some would view a local community leader. Some would actually view the local doctor. I'm working with a woman on her grants where the pediatrician <coughs> is the only person that the community members see all the time. So she's actually using it as a way to help the mothers uh, with school readiness for the children. So in other words, she's taking that element of a trusted member of, uh, this is communities in New Mexico, um, uh, of then providing a, a constant source of an interaction that they trust. They trust with the health of their babies, but then she can provide these other tools for their children to have things not related to just their physical health. So thank you, uh, Dean Jay, for describing that. And thank you for, for exploring um, epigenetics in more detail um, to answer the question. The way I understand um, epigenetics is like through an example. And I think it might be a common example that um, if there's two children, a black one and a white one, then of course there's two mothers. Um, not of course, but in many cases, in some cases. So the if the white mother accuses the black um, mother of the black child of um, hitting her white child, then um, they might have um, a discussion about what should be done to, to heal the situation or to respond to it. And so in, in this, this situation, this hypothetical situation, which reflects like real, real life situations, the black mother might, um, might turn to her, her black child and you know, possibly punish him for the thing that, that she did, but it could be a result of, of outside factors. And so before the child, the black child can even express um, his, his full like um, dreams of life um, or like in this instance, um, ideas of what he's, his actions were, the mother has already um, broken this, this chain of, of understanding excellence or you know, living um, excellence for a black community. So in this way, like the stress lives on generation after generation where the white child might be um, taught to excel and encouraged to do great things, the black child might, might not have that opportunity. Yeah, that's certainly ge generational um, 
deprivation, shall we say, or punishment or uh, and segregating the behavior and the psychological effects of that from uh, epigenetics is a very specific thing at the level of biology, which is why I brought that to the attention. But, but you know, many of the issues we associate with, uh, with disadvantaged neighborhoods are related to the kinds of things you say that there is a natural, uh, but, but as I said, a, a lot of that is simply uh, a child's response to the trauma of growing up in a dangerous situation or uh, an unhealthy situation, yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions in the queue, but I have one for you, Dean Jay. Um, looking forward, um, will co co I mean, I, I, to me, primarily COVID, secondarily, um, a new a presidential administration in power, will there be more science, better science on, you know, what maybe looking at the algorithms and getting them fixed or abandoning algorithms altogether? or doing more research into how we can impact, you know, not just anti-racist activities, but actual health, physical community activities for um, less advantaged communities that will help them have better health and better resilience in the future. Do you have great hopes that the severity of COVID and, and the fact that it, it's costing governments and things a lot of money around the world because, you know, people can't pay for this care and everybody has to get it will inspire real change in the future or is it gonna just, as soon as everybody forgets, it's gonna be back to normal? Um, it's a great question and a great hope. Um, and, and so I would say that um, the one thing that I have seen as a scientist is the mobilization of people from all different fields and backgrounds within the sciences to say, we have to work on this. And the comparison has been made to the sort of war effort in World War II, uh, et cetera. So the number of papers that uh, have been written in, on all of these aspects of, from the basic science all the way to the uh, community health and epidemiology, uh, and now to the issues of, of the, the health disparity, uh, clearly there, we have data. And, and this has been a, 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 an international world crisis of health. It, it's, the, it's the pandemic we all feared um, and we, we got it. Um, so um, uh, we're a little desensitized to it now, unfortunately, that, that we've had many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I remember when it first started that, that I thought, well, maybe we would lose as many people as we did in 9-11, which was about 2000, uh, um, and uh, how, how naive that, and silly that was. Uh, so, so, but what it has raised is everyone looking through the lens of their particular expertise is examining this and the issues of why has distribution been as terrible as that? Why has the health disparity been, it's shed a light on all the broken parts of the healthcare systems around the world, but I can only think about the, the, country, the country I live in. Um, and um, so, so the question, the, the second part of your question is, will it lead to substantive change? Um, maybe, in some, some things it definitely will. I think the concept that we, um, that, that we um, basically ignore the idea that pandemic could occur, that's not gonna happen again <laughs> um, at the very least. And so we have mechanisms in place to rapidly, and I would say the one thing that came out quickly was how rapidly the vaccine came to fruition or the vaccines um, from the different, uh, so, so that was a very positive thing. That didn't have to happen. It took a lot of people working hard to it. We also got lucky because this, particular virus responded. Um, and, 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 you know, they, there are viruses that, uh, like the flu, which are more complicated. And we still may face that later. But then the, the other issues is the health disparity. And so that uh, nowhere has, and that's really the beginning basis of all of this, you know, absolutely clear that our communities of color, our main communities, sorry, Flora, uh, in, in, your, in your continent, um, have clearly suffered more. So the, then it, it, it has permitted people who think about these things, who do research on them, to get data, to sort of say, well, why is this so? Whether it's qualitative data in interviews, whether it's quantitative data, but, but there's no question that health disparities have shown up um, and shown the cracks in the system. Now it's up to governments, uh, policymakers, to say, well, what changes can be made to improve this? Um, it will cost money, but, 
the, the amount of money that has been spent worldwide in, in this uh, health disaster uh, pales in comparison to any kinds of changes that one might make in policy. So I'm hopeful, I'm not extremely hopeful because of, uh, you know, the only analogy we have is the 1918 uh, pandemic of, uh, the, of influenza. And there, you know, people were playing baseball again in Yankee Stadium in 1920. So um, people adapt, but I'm hoping policymakers in, can, around the world can sort of use this. And as I said, we're nowhere out of the woods here, either in any of our countries here, and especially in developing countries. I think we're, this is going to drag on because of the inequities between rich and poor, um, you know, within our own communities, but especially worldwide. Um, I would love to see some action done on this front. And uh, President Biden in this country has said that he will begin thinking about other countries. But uh, I think lots of countries are, particularly rich countries, have a me first attitude. Um, uh, and uh, But we'll, we'll see. It, it will be a reflection of who we are as a as a species um, uh, in, in terms of our moral code, our compass, uh, how this proceeds in the next while. And I, I'm, I, I hope uh, we are guided by our, our better angels, as they say. That to me sounds like fantastic last words, unless there's anything yep. else you'd like to add. <laughs> I'll hand over to you tomorrow. <laughs> I was just gonna say, that sounds like an excellent place to draw this to a close, unless anyone has something they absolutely have to ask. I mean, I just want to thank um, Dean Jay very much for going to the double. He actually arranged for Nadidi to come and extracted her from her busy schedule. So we have him to thank for his contribution and hers. So I, I want to thank him. And Jabari for running all the technical stuff and you, Vicky, for holding my hand through this process um, and the Tufts International Group. Um, but I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it. If there's anything else of a sort of science or science and art bend that people would like to hear, you can get back to me or to Vicky um, in the international community and we can see what else we can put on. Um, fair enough, Vicky? Yep. And um, can I give two seconds to Eugenia to introduce her event, which is when, Eugenia, next week? 29th? Eugenia is a representative of our Greek alumni chapter. Hi. Um, yes, no, our event is on Monday, uh, 7 o'clock Greek time, which I believe is 5 p.m. UK time and will be uh, noon in Boston because we have our clock changes this weekend. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, talking about the future of education post-COVID. Oh, very interesting. Cool. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, a trustee of Tufts who's doing the presentation, who's uh, very involved in educational research. Right. Well, thank you all for your attention. Nice to thank meet you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye.